Good morning, family. <clears throat> Glad you're here with us today. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're wrapping up chapter 1 this morning. And if you've been following us online, you would know that today is the day that we're doing like Bible Jeopardy. We got 28 verses to go through. So how many of you have your swords with you? Raise them up if you got your Bible. We're going to be carving through bone and marrow today as we navigate through the text that Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. My prayer is that your hearts will be open, that your hearts will be prepared for what the Lord wants to share with you this morning, and that we will humble ourselves and allow the pride that is in our lives to just dissipate in the name of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Glorious Father, I thank you so much for your old, old rugged cross. It's about your cross that we are here. Father, it is about your Son, Jesus, why we worship. It's about your Son, Jesus, why we gather. It's about your Son, Jesus, why we worship. It's about your Son, Jesus, why we are in relationship with each other. So God, I pray that you will humble us to the very core. Help us to see you and not ourselves. God, I pray that as we enter into your text this morning, the, the caution that Paul gave to the church in Corinth is the same caution that you're giving to us all these years later. So God, I pray that we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And as we go verse by verse, Lord, that the words of your page will just jump out and breathe life into our hearts. We give you the honor and the glory in everything we say and everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now I titled this uh, sermon topic, the pride that destroys. Now, I'm sure there's not one person in this room that has ever struggled with pride before. Maybe some of you are very competitive. Maybe some of you think that you're really good at certain sports or that you're good at math or that you're good at engineering. Maybe some of you are gardeners in here and you've thought to yourself you're really good because your garden looks better than your neighbor's garden. Whatever the case may be, every single one of us in this room have struggled with pride. And we're going to learn this morning that that is one thing that God cannot stand, is pride. So a couple verses that jumped out at me before we even begun this week in study is Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 22, it says, Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? Why are we focusing so much on mankind and thinking they are good? when it is just a breath in their nostrils. Psalm 146, verse 3, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. There is no salvation in this world apart from Jesus. Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Once again, it's taking our eyes off of the Lord and putting it on man. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, 15 and also verse 17. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. It's kind of a great phrase. And are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Verse 17 says, All the nations are as nothing before him, and they are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. There's not one kingdom in this world that is more powerful than the kingdom of God. So why do we trust in mankind when we have been given some pretty clear indication from Scripture that we shouldn't rely on man? These verses have led me to begin this morning by asking you one question. Can or does God hate can or does God hate? And if so, what does he hate? And some of you are going, well, wait a second. How is this even possible? How can a God that is all loving hate? How is that even in the same vocabulary? This is something that is hard for people in the church and also outside the church to understand. People outside the church will argue, they'll say, well, I don't want to follow a God that is intolerant of what I want to do or the belief systems I have. I don't want to follow an unloving God. 
Then you got people in the church that will argue that God loves all, so there is no way that God can hate anything or anyone. Now the word hate in Hebrew actually translates enemies or foe. So when it says in Scripture, hate in the Old Testament, at least in the form of the Scripture that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning, it's talking about something inside of us that becomes an enemy of God. So the question is, what did we learn last week about church division? The church in Corinth was struggling with division. They were struggling with some disconnect. They were following man versus following Christ. We learn that what the church in Corinth was struggling with, at the very core of its essence, was pride. Pride of humanity. In fact, we also learn that the church in Philippi, and also the church in Ephesus, was struggling with the very same thing. It has come down to, I or we, know better than you. Now I'm sure that doesn't happen in our church. There's not one person that goes, I know better than you or us as a group know better than you, that doesn't at all sound like humanity, right? The church in Corinth was dealing with pride. It was their pride that was causing divisions. It was their pride that was causing fractions. It was their pride that was causing the church to split and splinter. And I'll say, I'll go as far as to say, in today's culture, a lot of church plants that are birthed out of issues are birthed out of pride rather than God orchestrating it by the power of His Holy Spirit. Paul said something profound last week that I once again want to remind us that we really need to take to heart. If you go back to verse 17 in chapter 1, he said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Our job is to preach the gospel, to preach Christ crucified. That's our job. But notice what he says, And not with words of eloquent wisdom, which is arrogance of of the world is what he's saying lest the cross of christ be emptied of its power think of that phrase lest the cross of christ be emptied of its power when we allow our pride and arrogance to take over as christ's representative sometimes we are emptying emptying the power of the cross i don't know about you but i don't want to empty the power of the cross because of my arrogance Or because I feel I know better than you. Or you feel you know better than me. So to bring me back to the opening question, does God hate, and if so, what does God hate? Let's let the scripture speak for itself rather than me. So number one on your notes, what does God hate? I put the word in there, pride. God can't stand pride. He can't stand it. Go to Proverbs. The book of Proverbs Proverbs 6, 16 and 17, it says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to Him. And the first one is haughty eyes. Now write haughty eyes down on your notes. How many have ever heard that expression before outside of Scripture? It's not like we're going around going, You're giving me the haughty eye look. You know, it doesn't make sense. But when we read it in Scripture, we kind of go, What is that? What does that even mean? Haughty eyes, what Scripture tells us, is that if we want true wisdom, we should not have haughty eyes. It's pride. The word haughty comes from the old Anglo-French word haut, which means high, and which also comes from the Latin word alatus, which is the word that means altitude. So if you were to put those two things together, we find that haughty eyes are the kind of eyes that look down at other people. You are posturing yourself higher than others and you're looking down on them. As if you are looking down from a higher up point of view. I know better, you don't. This comes in a variety of different ways. We do this in the church. I know it's kind of even apparent right now where I'm standing. I'm standing on a platform looking down. That is not healthy. We didn't, I didn't build the platform, okay? But at the end of the day, this is what it would look like. I'm looking down on you. I'm the professional. I've studied the scripture. You haven't. Therefore, I know you don't. Very dangerous. Or in the workplace. 
I have my education. I've been it longer. I know better than you. Head bump, head bump, head bump. Or in a family. I'm the husband. You're the wife. I'm telling you what to do. You need to submit. Now, that's a whole other topic that we can digest later as we navigate through Scripture. But we also do this with our children. I'm your parent. I'm telling you what to do. I know better than you. It's haughty eyes. Now, granted, there are moments. Wisdom, true wisdom through Scripture, does lead us in knowing a little bit more. However, it's in the heart of how we approach it. In the heart of what was going on here in the church of Corinth, and also this proverb, is the fact these haughty eyes are posting up against other people. The literal rendering of haughty eyes is high eyes or lift up their pupils. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, they don't look people in the eye to understand and engage them as equals. They look past them. What did Jesus do with children? He knelt down and he looked at them in their eyes. And he's Christ. He didn't go, oh, you child. This is describing the kind of person who is filled with pride, who thinks too highly of themselves and treat others as mere props and extras in their own blockbuster lifetime movie. (laughs) That life revolves around self. Now, fast forward 2,000 years to our current culture. Think about the kind of culture we live in where Instagram selfies are the way to go. Look at where I am. Look at where you're not. Every time we see something on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever other social media is out there, it's look at all the cool things I'm doing that you don't get to be a part of. The reason why God hates haughty eyes is because we are supposed to look up from our position to the one true God. And what happens is when pride comes in, we are basically presenting ourselves as God and authority in that situation that we're looking down on other people. We don't deserve ever to look down. Our job as Christ followers is to look up. That's it. We're called to worship the one true God. And think about Jesus and his teaching. Everything was about lowering yourself, submitting, sacrificing. First is last, last is first. Scripture after scripture, story after story, parable after parable is talking about a posture of humility, not a posture of pride. You and I are not in a position to look down on others. We are not God. So let's look at some other passages here. Psalm 101 verse 5 says, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has haughty looks and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. See, it comes from the heart, right? There's something going on inside. It's a worship disorder. Something's going on inside where you think you're better than somebody else. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant is abomination to the Lord. Isaiah 2, verse 11. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the pride of man shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. Which means it's better to learn humility now than when he returns and shows you. Jeremiah 50, verse 31. Behold, I'm against you, O proud one, says the Lord God of hosts. But not one of us in the church at Christ's community struggles with pride. There's a quote by John Piper. It says, so when I tell you that God hates something, I want you to hear that hatred as the echo of his love. He hates what he hates because it replaces or ruins something beautiful. God does not like pride because it wrecks what he created to be beautiful. So if you don't like the word hate, just substitute that for a foe. That we are a foe of God when we are dealing and struggling with pride. God hates human pride, and this is the root in the church in Corinth. But if you still don't believe me, 
If that wasn't enough scripture to back it, let's take a quick survey through the letters just to Corinth alone. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We're going to go verse by verse here and see if it's true or not that the church in Corinth was struggling with pride and then find out what pride is. So, 1 Corinthians 1, 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We are not allowed to boast in the presence of God. You can't have it both ways. I worship you, God, but I'm going to boast in front of you. That makes no sense. 1 Corinthians 1, 31. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So if you're going to say something, Boast about God. What has God done in your life? The good, the bad, and the ugly. What has He done? It's all about Him and nothing about us. How about those gardeners out there? 1 Corinthians 3, 7. So neither He who plants nor He who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. If your plants are actually growing, it's not you. You're thinking, oh man, you should see what I do with the soil. At the end of the day, anything that grows comes from God. 1 Corinthians 3.21 So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Stop boasting about humanity. It's about God. 1 Corinthians 4.6 I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. 1 Corinthians 4.18, some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. 1 Corinthians 5.2, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. He's going as far as to say, if the arrogance and the pride of your life is infesting the church, remove yourself or be removed. Woo! 1 Corinthians 8.2, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. If you even think you know, you ought to not know. Like you just don't know. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. The love passage. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. 2 Corinthians 1, 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God raises the dead. That's it. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. We can't claim anything. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Who's the power belong to? God. Not us. 2 Corinthians 12.9 But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made imperfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon you. Everything Paul is doing is exactly what Jesus taught. He's changing the perspectives of the heart. How many of you have ever boasted in your weakness? You don't get a job by boasting in your weaknesses. Right? When you're going to a job interview, you don't go, well, I'm really bad. I'm really bad at this. I'm not that great at that. But I think I'd benefit your company. Nobody is going to hire you for the most part. Why? Because the world values pride. Jesus values humility. So, what was the pride the church of Corinth was struggling with? Here's what the pride was in hopes that we don't follow. Boasting in themselves and not in the Lord. The church in Corinth was boasting in themselves. Well, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. And then you got some that are like, um, I'm of Christ. The other thing that they were doing is they were taking credit themselves for what God alone can do. They were relying on themselves and not on God. They were feeling sufficient in their own strength. 
and not in God's. How many of us have ever felt sufficient in our own strength? I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to save my marriage. I'm going to make sure my kids don't make mistakes. I'm going to make sure this company goes to the next level. They were not wanting to admit that they were just earthly vessels so that another could get the glory. Family, we are earthly vessels. And it's to God be the glory. If something good happens in your life or in your business or in your work or in your family, it's not because you are that good. It's because God is good. It was their unwillingness to admit weaknesses that may have sent the power of Jesus. When we can't admit our wrong, it's pride. And how many relationships, you're wrong, I'm right. I mean, think of that in your marriage. It's not me, it's you. You are always this. You are always that. That's like cuss words in relationships. So what does God love so much that he must hate pride with all of his might? The answers are plain from reading the text. He loves the heart that boasts in him. The heart change that boasts in him, not in ourselves. He loves the heart that gives credit for what he alone can do. He alone can fix your relationships, not you. He loves the heart that relies on his power, not your power. He loves the heart that wants him to get the glory in all things and that wants the power of his son to shine through your weakness. We were made to give glory to God. That's why we worship. We don't get up there and go, I thank you, Lord, for James. It's not about worshiping James. It's not about worshiping Paul. It's about worshiping God. We are made to boast about God. We are made to give Him credit for all good. We are made to rely on His power. We are made to magnify His glory and His all-sufficiency in our weakness. How many of you are weak? Hopefully all of you raise your hand. How many of you think you're strong? That's the problem. Therefore, what we can determine here is God has an enemy against pride. And we should hate in ourselves what God hates in us and wield the sword of His Spirit as best as we can to slay that dragon in our souls. If you struggle with pride, slay the dragon. Ask God to slay that dragon. Beat down that part of your flesh because it is going to destroy the inner fabric. We were not made to look down. We were made to worship and look up. Now that we know God hates this aspect of pride and that the church in Corinth was struggling with pride and today that we still struggle with pride, we can now actually read the text that we came to this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And let's see, after reading, what was it, 22 verses, what we can gain from the text this morning. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So if I could reread that to you, it's saying, The word of the cross, this is foolishness to those that think they know better. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When we look at the cross, it's the power. When others look at the cross, they consider it foolish. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He is going to destroy any earthly pride. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? He's basically calling out anyone that thinks they're good. Anyone that thinks they're smart. Scribes had to be. Debaters loved to be. And he's calling them out. He's going, where's the scribe? Where's the debater of the age? Who wants to have a conversation? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified as a stumbling block to both Jew and a folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. He's saying the foolishness of the cross is stronger than anything that the wisdom of humanity can actually understand. And we'll get to that here in a minute. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. If you are a Christ follower today and you believe in the cross and you believe that we preach Christ crucified, you are a fool to the world. So we're not not wise in the world's standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Beautiful. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human might or no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All huge words that only come from the power of the cross, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Oh man, who's alive today? Anyone awake? Number three under notes the cross of Christ is foolish to the proud. We are fools in the world's eyes. If you believe in this old rugged cross, you sang it a few minutes ago, you're a fool in the world. You're a fool to maybe your family. You're a fool to maybe some of your coworkers. You're a fool maybe to your neighbors. Is that okay with you? The cross of Christ is foolishness to the proud. The cross of Christ is foolishness to the Jew. The cross of Christ is foolishness to the Greek. Notice what he says. The cross of Christ is a stumbling block. To Jew and Greek, I'll tell you right now, every single person in this world, the cross is going to be a stumbling block for you. If you were in here today and you call yourself a Christ follower, it's because you tripped on the cross of Christ. You were redeemed because of the cross of Christ. You were restored because of the cross of Christ. But it made no sense to you in the beginning, right? Why is that? What I want to do is finish up this morning together trying to explain what Paul is trying to say here. The reason for this stumbling block is because the cross of Christ goes way beyond our earthly wisdom. This thing right here goes way beyond anything that humanity could comprehend. The word of the cross was met with scorn and contempt back in Corinth and also today. People of great wit and learning in Corinth were like, that's dumb. Why in the world would you believe that a man was hung on a cross, rose again on the third day? That's foolish. Think of it today. How many people, when they see the cross, they go, stupid, want nothing to do with it. I don't need that little story time scenario about this weird cross. Because they're trying to to gain all the wisdom they possibly can through earthly perspectives, through finite brains, and the cross does not fit their mold. Think of how many atheists that have turned to become Christians. It was like, what? No, I'm going to prove it over here. I'm going to prove it over here. That, That cross thing is driving me insane. Maybe some of you even have that testimony story of coming to know Christ because you tried every angle to discredit it. And then it met you head on, you tripped over it, and God met you. Similar to today, we have smart people. Smart people that psychoanalyze the cross, they debate the cross, they try to disprove the cross, they empty the cross of its power. 
the language that Paul is using here in this part of uh, 1 Corinthians is strongly reminiscent to Jesus' topic in Matthew chapter 7, in Jesus' language when he says, regarding the broad way that leads to destruction, that many will enter through it. And narrow is the way that leads to life, and very few people find it. The reason is pride versus humility. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and we all know our road way better than this road. And so we got people walking around. No wonder it's why, because everybody thinks they're the bee's knees. They think their path is the best way. They think they have enough brain power and wisdom that they've accumulated, whether through education or street smarts or through a variety of different reasons, and they think they're going to make it. Jesus and Paul are saying very similar things. If you're prideful, this is going to be foolish to you, and you're going to trip on this. But if you're humble, it will meet you. To those who are saved, the cross is pure and simple presentation of the power of God. For those of you that are Christ followers in here, this is power. And Paul is sharing here to the church that there is not one who is wise in all of Corinth that can save their souls. And there are some brilliant minds in Corinth at the time. And as we learned a few weeks ago, Corinth was a hub of a variety of things. Not only just a ton of sin, but... They were firsts to discover and to to plan and to do certain things. But at the end of the day, not one of those people can save the human soul. He's also proclaiming that God will destroy human wisdom and make the wisdom of this world foolish. It's hilarious to me. The world thinks this is foolish. God, in the end, is going to spin it around. Let them realize how foolish they are. But where is the wisdom of God and how is it demonstrated? Well, Paul says here that wisdom of God comes through the cross. Leaving us humans up to our own wisdom, wisdom, God demolishes human folly. Sinful humans are not only incapable of knowing God, they have degraded Him to a level of a creature. He's definitely not God. He's just... Maybe some people go, oh, he was a nice guy. Maybe some uh, different cults and religions will say that Jesus was at least a prophet. But, I mean, he didn't save anybody. How do we know that they whittled them down to just a creature? If we go back to Romans chapter 1, 21 to 23, it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to them. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is how ridiculous the mind is. I don't believe in a holy God, but that creature is so cool. I'll believe in that. Or I'll believe in a rock. Or I'll believe in a tree. Or I'll believe in a man. To us, this makes sense, right? If, if, this is, if this is truth to you, what I just said about all the other things seem foolish. But if you flip it in reverse, and we all were standing outside, and we were talking about this, people would drive by, they would honk horns, they would flip us off, they would tell us we're dumb. So Paul is now saying in 1 Corinthians 1.23, here's the wisdom of God. The salvation comes through the foolishness of the message that we preach. The message of the cross that we preach is foolishness to those that hear it, that have no desire to call Jesus Lord. He's not saying that the act of preaching is foolish. Okay? It is the preaching of the cross that is foolishness to those that think they are wise in their own haughty eyes. Their pride is like, nope doesn't pass the smell test and they're going to debate you and they're going to annihilate the cross they're going to psychoanalyze the cross they're going to cut down the cross to its core but i'll tell you right now they've tried before and it still remains 
Kings and kingdoms all pass away, but there's something about the name of Jesus Christ. Let's try to knock out an entire race of people. This has been done before, and His cross still remains. Let's kill them, bury them behind a huge stone. That'll knock it off. It actually engaged it even faster. It's amazing what happens with the cross. But it goes way beyond the foolishness of the wise on our planet. There's another quote. It says, A wise person, according to the Bible, is one who lives skillfully by obeying God's Word. So not only do we believe that Jesus is who He says He is and was, but now we obey His Word. There is a wisdom of the world that will lead us astray. The Apostle Paul says, But Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. In Him may be found all the treasures of wisdom. Those who obey His Word will live skillfully. Their lives will show the marks of fine craftsmanship. These are the ones who are wise indeed. If you just believe and that's it, you're not that wise. That's what Scripture is basically saying, because it also says demons believe. So where's the real true wisdom? Obeying what he asks. Living in holiness. Being, becoming more like Christ daily. So Paul is challenging two things. First, the cross is foolish to those that think they are wise. And he's addressing the church in Corinth because there were some in Corinth and also in the church that thought they knew better. And he's saying, no, 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 no. It's about the cross. And then he goes on to say, why would you think those that make fun of you for believing in Jesus wouldn't make fun of you even more for obeying him? Guess what, family? We are fools. For Christ. I mean, put that on a tattoo. Like, I'm a fool for Christ. Like, people go, yeah, you're a, a, a tool. Like, that makes no sense. We're not only a fool for believing in Christ crucified, but we're a fool for following and obeying His statutes and His word. Why are we so surprised that the world thinks that we are even more foolish for obeying Jesus? You know, like, growing up, Believing in Jesus, I, I was told I was a fool over and over again by people. But where it really came in is when I stood on the Word of God and obeyed Him. That sends them through the roof. What? So you not only believe that a man came down and died on the cross, rose again on the third day? Yeah. You not only believe that, but you're actually going to follow him where, where the last is first and the first is last? That makes no sense to me. You're an idiot, James. You're a fool. All right, great. I'd rather be a fool in the eyes of the world than a fool in the eyes of Christ. Where are we at today, family? Are we accepting the foolishness of the cross to a foolish world? Or are we going, yeah, I'm only going to really be following the Lord on Sunday. Sunday's holy day. All the other days are a little bit more free. I'll do whatever I want to do there. That's what the world would say to do. We live in a hostile world that won't value holiness. This world, this culture we live in, does not care for holiness. It cares for self. Because they do not value the one who we believe as true and holy. The wisdom of God was displayed on the cross. Here's another quote. It is this through the power of God's grace operative in the cross that one is delivered from the wisdom of this age and granted in Christ whose is the power of God and the wisdom of God a new identity and a new life. Guess what? When we become Christ followers, we get a whole new identity. A whole new identity. It's no longer James. It's no longer this earth suit, which is gnarly and nasty. I get a new heart. He takes out the old heart of stone, puts in a new heart of flesh. We get a new identity when we accept Jesus, and that's foolishness to a world. 
Kind of reminds me of a song. We believe. How many of you remember that song? Maybe you've sung that song. I love this song. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Godhead three in one. We believe He has given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in a resurrection and that He's coming back again. We believe. We believe. And when we believe that, we are fools and considered fools for it. Our culture struggles with the very same thing as the culture in Corinth. Notice what it says in verses 22 and 23. People either want signs and wonders to believe or personal achievement to come from the Messiah. I will only believe in you and I will follow you if you do this. If you perform another miracle, I'll tell you right now, think of all the miracles that Jesus did. Think of all the people that showed up to watch his miracles and then think of all the people that showed up to watch him get crucified. Did the numbers line up? So it doesn't matter how many times we see signs and wonders, that's not going to change the human heart. But then you got the other side that is like, no, I want personal achievement. Notice what he says. The Jews wanted signs and wonders, and the Greeks wanted salvation to be something that they could personally acquire through being good. So I'm only going to believe if you show me something, and I'm only going to believe if I could get saved for being good. I'll just do a lot of really good stuff. The cross was so scandalous to that community. And it's still scandalous today. The spirit of the age cannot and will not accept the idea that God would identify with humankind in weakness, suffering, and death. Nobody wants to follow that kind of a God in this world. If God would show himself, it must be with such strength to abolish our enemies. And that's what the Jews were hoping for. I want a Messiah that's going to come and destroy Rome. Then I'll believe. That didn't come in that season, but that's what the Jews were hoping for. The irony in that way of thinking is that if God were to do that, we would all perish. Because Jews thought they were better than Romans, and Romans thought they were better than Jews. Pride. The world remains blind to the truth, not because God has not shown himself, but because what he has shown is simply not acceptable or good enough for them which is pride again. I need God to show himself this way in my finite brain to help me in my box, and then I will believe. And then you got somebody over here who's like, I need God to show himself this way in my form of box so that then I will believe. God will show himself the way he wants to show himself, and how he did it was through the cross. And probably for the most part, that was not someone's box. Someone wasn't sitting there going, I need the Messiah to come down and die on a cross and then I will believe. We don't have any of those stories. He should not have come in a manger, but a throne. Should not have identified with the weak, but with the strong. He should not have been poor. He should have been powerful. Should not have ridden in on a donkey. He should have come in on a chariot. The further irony of this kind of thinking is that the world need only wait for his second coming to see the mighty display of his power and his majesty. But sadly, when they do see him in the end, it will be entirely too late for those who could not accept the Savior unless he could have come on their own terms. Maybe some of you in this room are going, I am waiting for God to come on my terms. I'll tell you right now, that's not how he rolls. He's not going to go, oh, is this your term? Oh, okay. I'm going to come in this way. He already came. The cross speaks for itself. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll wrap up. 7 to 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out 
of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. False things. And with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth to be saved. So those that are still waiting around for signs and wonders, Satan's going to use that at his disposal. and He's going to give you a bunch of garbage that's not true. Verse 11, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may be uh, may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh-oh. What the church in Corinth was struggling with is what God was choosing. God was choosing something and they didn't like it. Verse 28 says, God chose what is low to despise the world. God chose that. Then it goes on, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So countercultural. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And this is incredible for the church in Corinth. God was not calling nobles. He was calling nobodies. And you're a bunch of nobodies. Thank God. I heard a pastor once say, he said, I'm just a nobody trying to tell other nobodies about somebody. We are nobodies, and I am glad I'm a nobody. The selection of God is designed to bring silence to the wisdom of men. Wait, James, so you're telling me that God died on a cross? Absolutely. Wait, you're telling me that, that your God accepts all people as long as they repent from their sin and follow and obey his statutes? Absolutely. Wait, James, you're telling me that God doesn't care about statuses and baggage? Absolutely. Wait, you're telling me that your God loves those that count themselves less than you? That's exactly what I'm telling you. God selects the foolish to shame the wise. And guess what? If you have been selected and you've received him today, you're a fool. Thank God. I'm glad you're a fool. I'm a fool too. God selects the weak. How much of you thought were, you were strong? No, 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 no. You're weak. Because it takes weakness to receive the cross. We were weak. Why? To shame the strong. God selects nobodies to shame those who think they are somebody. This is why pride is so dangerous. Paul was not saying all this to the church to insult the church. He was saying this to the church to love the church. Instead, he was reminding the church that their salvation was not in a socioeconomic matter. It was not in the color of their skin. It was not how much money they had in their account. Why? Because they weren't nobles. Some were. A lot were slaves. And God brought them all to the table, and they were all saved through Christ. So let me reread verse 31, and we'll close in prayer. It is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Are you boasting in God or are you boasting in yourself? Are you boasting in God or are you, are you pretending, well, God gave me these gifts, so I'm going to do it? That's fake. That's fake boasting in God. Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. The cross is, the, is our wisdom. So let me say this, O oh foolish church in the eyes of the world, we believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, the triune God. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that He conquered death. We believe who He is because He is coming back again. And guess what? If you believe that today and you're walking in that fullness, you're a fool to the world. But once again, I'll close with this. I'd rather be a fool in the world's eyes than a fool in the eyes of Christ. Let's pray.